Hello and welcome. My name is Svetlana Stone. You are watching Artist Voices, where we believe it's essential for artist voices to be heard. And we are pleased to have Mac McClure here at Public Media Network to learn what does it take to be a musician in the 21st century. Thank you for watching us. Hi, Mac. Uh, how are you today? Doing great, thanks. Really pleased to be here. Uh, we are happy to have you. And uh, if you can tell with us your story, how um, you came to Kalamazoo, uh, what are you doing here? <laughs> well, I'm here in Kalamazoo. I will be giving a concert Monday night in the university at the Dalton Center. Um, how I came to Kalamazoo is kind of an interesting story. Um, I was born in Florida. And I studied Romance languages at the University of North Carolina, and at the same time studied piano. And so for one year, Phyllis Rappaport was visiting professor. And then I left the United States and moved to Spain, where I lived for 30 years. And I studied at the Marshall Academy in Barcelona. And I studied with Alicia de la Rocha, who was probably one of the greater pianists of the 20th century. And Phyllis and I always stayed in touch up until she passed away. We, we were always close. And so the first time I came to Kalamazoo was in the early 90s. Wow. And, <laughs> um, and so I'd been back several times. And good friends here, people that, you know, that I know very well. And so it's always a pleasure to come here. And I... Um, so I'm giving the concert, and we'll probably listen to a couple of students at the university, where my close friend Lori Sims teaches, and who is a, just a fabulous pianist also, and it's always wonderful to spend time with her. So it's good all the way around. So uh, we're happy that um, you're here and can share your talent with us, with the people in Kalamazoo. And tell us, please, your story, how you're a pianist. Yes. Uh, so how you become a pianist, who influenced you, and what story behind of that? Well, I think everyone who's a classical musician comes to the instrument in a very personal way. Um, I was always attracted to the piano as a child. And... Um, it was basically an aunt, a uh, sister of my father, who said, this kid needs piano lessons. And, you know... Um, so parents noticed that you're interesting in the piano. Well, there wasn't a piano in my house, but there oh. was a piano in my grandmother's house. Huh. And, um, you know, and I would always pick out tunes. And, and, um, and so it was my aunt who basically told my father, find him a piano teacher or a music teacher. And that's basically how it started. And um, and I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I've always had so many interests in so many different things. And languages has always been something that's very, has interested me very much. And um, that's also some been something that's been easy for me to learn other languages. And so for a time it was, should I become a, you know, simultaneous interpreter, or should I be a musician? So what was your, another language, as you said? Well, I, uh, basically, as well as English, I speak Spanish, Catalan, and French. Wow. And, um, and I've studied German and Portuguese. Is that I also like studied Arabic, but that was just, like, way too hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, so besides English, what is the, your other best language? Well, Spanish, Spanish. and Catalan are wow. pretty much equal. I mean, I don't, I, it's very odd when I'm in a Spanish speaking environment, I dream in Spanish. Or if I'm in Barcelona, where with most people I speak Catalan, I, I, the, the, those three languages are completely interchangeable for me. And French is pretty much on the same level. I don't use it as much because I, you know, I live in Colombia now, so there's not, you don't run across, but you know, when you live in northern Spain, it's, you know, a one-hour drive to France, so it's different. That's true. So you were kind of like make a decision, become a pianist or <laughs> yeah. interpreter. Yeah. So, and so but piano now, one, you know, right? I, well, the piano one, but oddly, I've lived in 
foreign countries for the last almost 40 years, so I do use the languages on a daily basis. So, And you work as a professor uh, in Colombia. Correct? Yes, I teach at the National University in Bogota, which is the largest university in the country. And it's like the s second or third largest university in South America. And so it's a big school. And the conservatory... How many students in there? There's 85,000. Oh, my God. It's like a city of well, musicians. Well, they're not all on the same campus, but it's big. But still, <laughs> it's, it's very it's impressive. It's big. It's big. I came uh, from the city, you know, that we have only like 90 thousand people population yeah. and you have musicians yeah. well they're not all musicians <laughs> i mean the university has everything, uh, everything. but um, there's in the conservatory there's about 700 students oh, wow which is still a big school so you're working with the students uh and um we know that uh, being musician is uh, not that easy like people think so when you see a student that is like a talented Uh, but he kind of like I need a motivation. Uh, do you um, uh, how you motivate your students to like show or their best? Well, music is. I mean, as you said, music is not as easy as people think it think, is. I mean, exactly. and more important, well, talent is good, and there has to be yeah. talent there. But if there's not a very strong work ethic behind that and discipline and um yeah hard work it, the talent doesn't go anywhere um in my case in colombia there's a lot of talent and a lot of difficulties to get everything together in order to f continue studying outside of colombia Most of my students, not all of them, but most of them go to the United States. Some go to Canada. Some go to England. Um, Europe's a bit difficult because of the, the, the classical music and the conservatories aren't completely integrated into university systems. So sometimes they have to be very careful if they go to Europe to make sure that they get a degree that is useful in Colombia, you know, that can be, that is a university degree. But yeah, um, there's a lot of talent and a lot of students really work hard. And so it's, uh, it's sort of a support process to help them reach their goals. And so, you know, I do the best that I, at least I try to do the best I can to help them become the best version of themselves. So um, you are also a um, performer. Yeah. And not only professor, right? So how, mm. like, um, what does a performance um, mean to you? And, uh, like, how long it does take you to, like, be prepared? Like you said, it's, the talent is obviously not enough. Uh, it's have well, to it be takes a lot of hours of practice. And... Part of, I think it's easier to do one thing or the other, to just perform. If you only perform, you're more focused. If you only teach, you're more focused on your teachers, teaching. your teaching. And when you do lots of things, you know, I, I have a huge amount of respect that uh, for performers that are able to teach to divide time for family, to, I mean, you know, it's because all of these things divide your attention. That's true. And um, especially, you know, performing as a soloist or, you know, when you have to memorize, it's, it's a huge effort, you know. You know, it's people see an opera production and you know just you, they don't no one stops to think how many words 
had to be memorized. Memorized, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, and you know, if you look at a piano recital, there's millions of notes. A million of notes, and it's and everyone good. goes in a specific place at a specific time with a specific intensity with a specific volume, and all that has to be studied in practice. So it's a, it's a huge undertaking, you know. So, um, you know, and I, you know, I, I work in in a very large university and you know some people said you know you know oh but all you have to do to get a master's degree is play a recital i said memorize your dissertation that's and we'll talk about it that's true memorize yeah. your dissertation very good word point. for word and i will sit there and i will mark you down for every comma that's not right every period that's wow. not right and every exclamation I like it. <laughs> it's the same principle i love it yeah you know like i mean you know it's the same principle i said memorize your you know your dissertation Word to word, yeah. Yeah, you know. Like two hours of playing or whatever, speaking, yeah, like, I mean, right? You know, What's the average musician must to play, like, if they are performed, like, on a professional level? How many hours of uh, material they need I to mean, know? I mean, normally, on, in, a, in a classical recital, it's 70 to 80 minutes of music. Some can be shorter, 45, 50. But normally, if it's sort of a, uh, a festival or a concert series, you know, they sort of expect you to keep the people occupied two hours with an intermission, <laughs> <laughs> including the intermission. So, you know, if wow. you've got in between 35 and 40 minutes per half, and then they get a 20 minute intermission, then that's pretty, that's normal. Sometimes it can be less. And since this COVID thing, you know, now you see recitals that are with no intermission. And so they tend to be 55, 60 minutes maximum but with no break which is a little bit more tiring but it's doable it's doable uh, welcome back for those of you who just tuned in we are here at public media network uh, with uh, musician artist Mac uh, from Colombia uh, to talk about what does it take to be a musician in the 21st century. Thank you for watching us. And Mac, thank you so much for sharing so much interesting uh, information. Um, we are pleased to have you. And I would like to learn more about um, what does it take to be a musician. And uh, I want to ask you, do you compose music or you just teach and perform? Well, I guess you would say I don't compose. You don't compose. Um, many interpreters or performers don't compose. I guess you could compare that to actors and screen script writers. You know, the actors don't write what they perform. You know, they learn and study the script, and that's what they work with, and that's what we do. We study the score and present our interpretation of a piece. Obviously, there are composer performers, but there's a lot less of those than performers, I guess you would say. And of course, I would like to ask you about the challenges as a musician. What were your challenges when uh, on your way to become pianist and uh, professors and of course, moving to Spain, then Colombia from America? What were your challenges? Uh, and during that time, what was the best advice you received? Well, I think the world has changed incredibly in the last you know, 25, 30 years. And the path that I took is, is, is really, I don't know if that would be a good choice nowadays. Um, I was trained to perform. That was what my education was. I, because I'm curious, have done lots of other things like organize festivals, work in, um, just because I'm curious and I liked to do different things. Um, but I don't think that the traditional way of studying is the best way to go now. 
And especially when I look at long, young pianists, I think they need so much more. I think, you know... What do you mean by that? I think they need to be well-informed and have skills in business management because they are the business. You are the product that you have to sell. That's true. And I also think that they need um, arts management. They need to know how to write a grant. They need to know how to lay out a proposal. They need to know how to organize a festival. They need to know how to do outreach. They need to know how to reach a new public that that's going to listen to them. Um, they need to know how to interact with the community. Um, I think the star system of what was... There's still people performing who are in their 80s who are fantastic musicians, but they lived and developed in an entirely different atmosphere and growing zone. And so... And now the way the star system works, you see these people that go like fireworks. They take off, there's a big burst, and then they slowly start to disappear. disappear yeah. Because there's another, you know, child prodigy coming behind. And so I think you need a lot of resources to look into how what you do helps the people around you and helps the community. And different ways for this for you as a business, because basically the business is you, how you're going to interact with the world and your community. And, um, you know, I don't th think there's, there's a very few small group of great pianists who have a career, who are playing 80 concerts a year, but that's a very small percentage. And so the rest of the people have to figure out how they're going to make music fit into their lives and how they're going to, you know, interact with community, promoters, the whole, the whole business. And I think students and upcoming artists really need that, you know, because even if you win the Van Cliburn or, you know, some huge competition. piano comp competition... It's probably not going to be the big career because, you know, we did this with my students. We looked at all of the winners of, like, the Queen Elizabeth, the Tchaikovsky, the Paloma <laughs> O'Shea. And so you've got these major competitions that have been working for 40, 50 years. And you see the winners. And so we've got, you know, a list of 35 winners, and you only see three names that you recognize. That's because these three people either made a big career or a big career big enough to be recognized. But the other 30 were obviously very good pianists who either weren't lucky, didn't have the connections, didn't have the stamina. You know, it's, there's a whole gambit of social, emotional... Um, you know, you, you have to know how to dress, have to know how to interact with people, how to meet managers, how to take advantage of situations. And that's, that has nothing to do with how you play. Yeah, so you mean, you think it's, it's a luck or, me, or it's go back to what you said, skills that uh, it's a whole, you, musicians a whole have. a lot of like, skills yeah, that musicians that need, need. Exactly. You know, and um, um, I, know, I know this pianist, she's, absolutely brilliant i mean and she says she's the best second prize pianist she was second prize in the chopin second prize in the busoni second prize in the beethoven and she's had a fabulous career but it wasn't a huge spectacular career that it could have been and she always says i was in the bathroom when the man that was going to make me famous walked by <laughs> <laughs> But do you really believe but that's it's really different? I, I don't think she was in the bathroom. She could have been eating lunch. But the thing just, is, yeah. there's a whole lot of other factors. factors that work. And it's not only a question that there's something else. You look at someone like, I don't know, Martha Agarich the, the, or um, 
I don't know, um, Maria Jalpides, who are in their 80s and have had a 60-year career. Not only is the question of having a big career, but how many people have you seen on the front page of magazines and, and, and at Carnegie Hall and with all the big orchestras and 10 years down the road, they've disappeared? That's true. And so I think it's, and so at least from my humble perspective as a teacher, I think not only is it a question of sitting down and playing the piano and getting the notes right, you ha need a whole lot of resources that are a, a series of complicated things that, that go into this recipe that make you into a successful musician. And by successful, I don't mean being playing with the top orchestras and playing, but that you are living the classical life, which I can't believe I just said that because that's <laughs> an absolutely spectacular um, <laughs> pro TV program of I interviews. It. But, it's, uh -huh. but, but it's very, but, but living the classical life, which is actually, you know, it's a whole different ballgame, but it's, you know, something that I adore. But there are many ways to live the classical life. And I think what's most important is that you're happy, productive, and you give something back. I love it. And so there's many ways to do that, but it's more than just sitting hours in a practice room practicing. So, you know, I think you have to look at all of these different variants and see how that, how, because it's a, it's a personal thing. That's every business is different. And every McDonald's is different. They're all franchises. And so the way they work, you know, they all have the two arches, but they're all different. Every musician is different. And so I think it's just a question of seeing and learning, learning how to write a grant, learning how to do invoicing, learning how to, you know, all of the things that, you know, festivals, community outreach, organizing concerts, all of these things or stuff, you know, that, that Important. if you already know that, you're a step ahead. You know, I have a very dear friend that won a major competition, and, you know, and she said the first time she organized, she has a very successful festival, and she said the first two years were really rough because she didn't know what she was doing. You and know, now that she's been doing it for quite a few years you learn a lot but if you'd already knew those skills it would it be, much, be easier. much easier yeah so so what would be the advice that you give it uh, gonna give to the students like who are already in this field or musicians i would say practice 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 that you know the piano doesn't give any gifts <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> and the, the pianist the piano is a very bad lover. It will try to, it, you know, it's it will backstab you for, you know, it's so true. In his autobiography, Arthur Rubinstein was a great pianist. He says, if I don't practice two days, my wife knows. <laughs> if I don't practice three days, my manager knows. <laughs> and if I don't practice four days, the lady in the third row knows. Wow. So, you know, the piano is not the greatest friend as far as, you know, helping you out. But my advice would be to look at all of the things that support and go along with the musical industry, how to record yourself. Nowadays, you have to know how to record yourself. You have to know how to record a, audio, a video for an audition, for a competition. Um, it's the first step. It's the first filter now. So you have to know how to record yourself. And you have to know how to record yourself to get the best version of you. Okay. You have to know how to promote yourself. You know, have to know how to design um, uh, Just a, poster. a flyer, yeah. a poster. You know, I make my students learn how to do that. It's a good thing. Um, you know, because if you're starting out, you have no money. So what are you going to pay people to do that? And then, you, you know, uh, you need to know how to apply to festivals, how to apply for a grant, how to present yourself. And you have to know how to present yourself basically online because now a lot of the filters, especially since the pandemic, the first cut is a video. So know what makes this 
crazy music world work and at least have the minimal tools to defend yourself. Because defending yourself is going to give you the capacity to promote yourself. And maybe someone will hear you who thinks, you know, it's, they can make money off of you. Basically, it's that, you know, if they think you're a product that's sellable. So. Yes. That's awesome advice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Mac, how people can find information about you, um, if you can share with maybe well, like your future performances or websites so my, they can follow everything, you? Everything's on the website. I have recorded probably about 40 CDs that are in iTunes, Spotify, on all of the digital platforms. Under Mac McClure? Mm -hmm. Mac. And What's the website? www.macmcclure.com mm -hmm. and so that's where they can find out information of where I'm playing what I'm doing other interests you know um, sometimes in, in my website when, when I find a great restaurant if it has the great combination of good cooking and good wine it goes on the website <laughs> <laughs> so that's you know priorities <laughs> So thank you, thank you again. Uh, it was um, very nice to learn about you, about your music, and your great advices. Uh, we're so thankful that you uh, find the time to share with your wisdom, wow. with your talent, <laughs> I with don't us. Know and wisdom we, here, but we just <laughs> cannot wait until to hear what you're gonna play on Monday uh, at Western Michigan University Dalton it's, Center. It's the first half is traditional classical music, Mozart, Haydn, and Chopin. The second half is Spanish music. I start with seven improvisations that were written. They're called Improvisations in Silence. And they were written in 2020 during the close down when everybody was stuck at home. And then three, five little pieces by a friend of mine who is a Spanish composer, Moises Bertran. And finishing with three pieces by the Spanish composer, Goyes, um, Granados from Goyescas. So, so it's a varied program and I hope people like it. Of course, hey, we cannot, I cannot wait to hear it. And thank you again. Lovely to be here. Thank, thank you for the invitation. Thank you. We hope you will, uh, will come again and uh, you know, we will uh, listen more to your music. So, well, this uh, concludes this episode of Artist Voices. We are um, thank Mark McClure for joining us tonight at Public Media Network, where we believe it's essential for artist voices to be heard. And thank you for watching us and see you next time. <laughs>